In Peru, truckers extended their strike despite preliminary agreements reached with the national government. Authorities called for calm in the midst of violent protests and looting. Kremlin insists on having a debate at the United Nations Security Council to unveil Western falsehoods about alleged civilian killings in Bucha. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa announced that all COVID-19 pandemic legal restrictions would end at midnight, declaring it was time to resume growing the economy. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor, Dio Martin, from the Telstra Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. In Peru, the preliminary agreement reached between the government and the transportation companies did not meet the expectations of the service providers and protests have escalated. The government of Pedro Castillo ordered the exoneration of fines and taxes on 84 and 90 octane gasoline, a measure that collective carriers workers consider insufficient. This measure responds to only one of the demands included in the list of directives that the transport union requires to put an end to the protests. For this reason, the demonstrations proliferated and spread throughout the regions where the highways remain blocked and, in some cases, have attacked government facilities. In Bolivia, the trial against the former de facto president, Janine Añez, resumed on Monday. The trial is called the Coup d'Etat II, and it looks into the role of Añez during the 2019 Coup d'Etat. The authorities indicated that the former president could receive up to 12 years in prison. The trial was postponed after Agnes was indisposed during a virtual trial session and what the government considers to be a maneuver to delay the start of the process. The prosecution has exposed the responsibility of Agnes, arguing there was no constitutional succession. The Bolivian representation presents its arguments before the International Court of Justice in the Netherlands regarding Chile's claims for the waters of the Silala River. In the past statements at the Hague, the Chilean delegation acknowledged that the waters originate in Bolivian territory and that the work of a private company channeled this territory to Chile. According to the Bolivian ambassador and spokesman for this process, Sebastián Michel, his country will base its position on scientific information about the course of the waters, avoiding discussions based on historical documents. This is the second time that both nations have gone to trial over the tenure of the waters. In this process, Bolivia hopes to demonstrate that the waters of the Silala were diverted by Chile, while Chile hopes to show that the river is international. Janitors and cleanup workers in Rio de Janeiro, southeast of Brazil, agreed to resume strike activities on Monday after a temporary suspension of demonstrations during the weekend. The protests retaking come after the cleanup workers' unions rejected the last proposal made by City Hall, but decided to make a hiatus to temporarily return to the services to collect the city's garbage due to the rains and avoid further inconvenience to the population. The Union of Workers of Cleaning and Conservation Companies of the municipality reported that in the last three days, the mayor's office has not presented any satisfactory proposal for the employees of the Municipal Urban Cleaning Company. In Brazil, the number of deaths rose to 18 as a result of another storm that caused heavy rains, floods and landslides in Rio de Janeiro. Police officials declared that the new seven dead were a woman and her six infants who were buried by a landslide caused by heavy rainfall in the city of Parati. The civil defense of the municipality of Angra dos Reis announced another eight fatalities in the town and the fire department later reported a ninth loss, all found on Sunday. On Friday, the city of Parati declared a state of emergency due to rainfall just on the date when a landslide destroyed a federal highway police post with no fatalities or injuries reported by then. In Colombia, the electoral campaign of the presidential formula for the historical PAC coalition, Gustavo Pedro and Francia Marquez, is advancing in the run-up to the elections on May 29th. The couple for the historical PAC began a national tour called the Four Cardinal Points on Friday. The candidates arrived on Sunday in Tumaco, the department of Nariño, where the first stage of the campaign activities culminated. In all these places, Pedro and Marquez presented their government plan and listened to the proposals of the inhabitants with whom they ratified their commitment to a change in the country.
Hundreds of motorcyclists blocked streets in Bogota to protest against the city's new regulations, which ban more than one passenger per motorcycle on certain days and hours of the week in an attempt to tackle rising street crime. Mayor Claudia Lopez defends a measure which will limit to only one the number of passengers on a motorcycle on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. She says these are the times when the most delinquency on motorcycles occurs. Meanwhile, motorcyclists believe the measure would only stigmatize uh, them more than tackle the security. We are protesting because we are tired of the persecution that the police have against us. We are tired of the majorities and the absurd laws she's putting out. They are blaming us for all the insecurity. Now, if there is a robbery, it is taken for granted that the motorcyclists are responsible. On Monday, Cuba's health ministry announced the easing of COVID-19 restrictions on travelers arriving from abroad as the Caribbean nation will no longer request a negative PCR test or a vaccination certificate as mandatory for travelers entering the country. According to Cuba's health officials, this decision considers the international and national epidemiological situation and the levels of immunization achieved against the coronavirus. The top official of epidemiology, Director Francisco Duran, announced that the new policy will take effect as of Wednesday. However, authorities will continue to carry out random tests at the island's entry points and maintain the mandatory use of masks. The measure is part of the relaxation and the requirements for tourists that Cuba has been taking since the end of 2021. On November 15th of that year, the country stopped requiring travelers to be quarantined after overcoming several months of rising infections. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. And welcome back to From the South. The Russian government on Monday rejected all accusations for the alleged massacre committed by Russian troops in the Ukrainian town of Bucha. Russian Foreign Affairs Minister Sergei Lavrov branded the situation created around the Ukrainian city of Bucha as a slander and said it is a direct threat to international security. In that regard, he denounced that a staging was prepared there and that is what's being spread through all news outlets and all social media by the Ukrainian representatives and their Western sponsors, saying the images were recorded after the Russian troops had left the place. Lavrov also said that Russia sees such provocations as a direct threat to world peace and security, and therefore called for an urgent meeting of the United Nations Security Council. We demand an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council on this issue. We see such provocation as a direct threat to international peace and security. In that regard, the Russian foreign minister said that such actions are used by the Western Ukraine as part of their anti-Russian propaganda. The Russian military city withdrew from this city on March 3rd. On March 31st, the mayor of the city of Bucha solemnly said that everything was in order for him. Two more days later, we saw how the same staging was organized on the streets, which they are now trying to use for anti-Russian purpose. At the United Nations, Russia's ambassador to the UN, Vasily Nebenzia, has briefed reporters denying accusations of mass killings in the Ukrainian town of Bucha near Kiev. He has called on the United Nations Security Council to convene on the matter tomorrow, April 5. Now, if you look carefully at uh, what you see in Bucha about the corpse, corpses that lie on the streets that were never existing uh, before the Russian troops arrived, um, left, sorry, uh, before they left, uh, and suddenly they appear on the streets, lying, uh, lying on the uh, on, on, on the on the road, uh, one by one, right and left. Uh, some of them are moving. Some of them, uh, some of them are uh, signing, showing the signs of life. You you cannot escape from from an understanding that that is a that is a stage. Uh, that is a stage, that is a fake, that this is a provocation. And Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic assured that his country will continue to maintain friendly bilateral relations with Russia, preserving neutrality in relation to military alliances. This is what the head of state said after winning the first round of the presidential elections held on Sunday. The president did not hesitate to reaffirm that the traditional friendships between the two countries must not be lost. 
Vucic also stressed the impact of the situation in Ukraine and said that it was a cause of strong polarization in the region. Now, he won the presidential election with more than 60 percent of the vote. German Federal Finance Minister Christian Lindner said in an interview published in the national media that his country is being affected by the situation in Ukraine. Now they are compelled to pay for imported energy above the usual price. He admitted that the government cannot replace the loss of prosperity and can only soften the larger blows. He acknowledged that the end of Russian hydrocarbon supplies would have noticeable and serious effects for the country. The repercussions, Lindner said, would go beyond money because it will affect the physical availability of energy for citizens. The government of Greece reported the cancellation of the entire debt acquired with the International Monetary Fund in May 2010. The National Finance Minister Christos Stakouras announced on Monday, April 4th, that his nation had completed the payment of its debt with the IMF, acquired in May 2010 when Greece turned to the fund for financial support. The head of the Finance Department described this as a very positive event, the result of the current government's economic policy, and at the same time it sends a signal of economic stability and it saves the public purse 230 million euros. On the occasion of the beginning of Ramadan, the Holy Muslim Festival, the Syria Unites Us Charity Festival began this weekend in the capital city of a government initiative supported by the private sector which seeks to guarantee basic products at discounted prices in order to mitigate the negative impact of the Western economic blockade on the lives of the citizens. Our correspondent in Syria, Wisham Wanous, brings us more details. The fair, which is expected to last until the end of the Holy Ramadan, has the participation of 250 national industrial and commercial companies specialized in food, hygienic materials, household appliances, and textiles. This company whose aim is to promote social solidarity and the human values that characterize the Muslim fasting months, contribute to satisfy the basic needs of the citizens at affordable prices. Ramadan is the month of kindness and generosity, and we, as businessmen and traders, reinforce these Ramadan values through the social commercial action and not meeting people's needs at lower prices and not for profit. The products at this fair are sold directly from the producer to the consumer without middlemen and this is an effective mechanism in terms of lowering prices so that we can help citizens and mitigate negative impacts on their lives caused by the economic crisis resulting from the war and the Western economic blockade. At the same time, families affected by the war, as well as military personnel and civilians wounded for their homeland, make a noteworthy presence at these festival activities. With their penny projects, they compete with the big companies by offering a wide range of quality handmade products, handicrafts, textiles, and food made from natural components, which are characterized by their high quality fair prices. This edition of the festival, unlike previous years, is characterized by allocating a high number of booths to producer families and those wounded for their homeland, in recognition of the great sacrifice they made in defense of the homeland and to help them to have a sustainable source of income and to reintegrate into society. As a wounded man from the homeland, like all the other wounded, I am grateful that the state helped me to overcome difficulties of the injuries I suffered in the war and to recover my life and return to work. As the owner of a production mini project and as a proof of this, I'm participating today together with the other wounded in this great trade festival. The Ramadan Charity Fair is one of the many humanitarian actions carried out during these months to help vulnerable families. These initiatives are grounded in willpower, patience, solidarity and tolerance. What is that mandatory image of Islam and that Syrians consider essential to threaten, so as the triumph in the fight against Western economic system? Hisham News, Telesur, Damascus, Syria. We have more news coming up after one final short break. Please stay with us.
Hi, and welcome back. On Monday, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced that all COVID-19 pandemic legal restrictions would end at midnight, declaring it was time to resume growing the economy or expanding it. Ramaphosa said his country, which is the hardest hit on the continent, has seen death rates plunge from an average daily high of 420 in July last year to just 12 in the past week, at least on record. During a televised address, the South African president said his government decided to terminate the national state of disaster with effect from midnight tonight, which has been in place since March 15, 2020. However, some transitional measures, such as a mask wearing and indoor, in indoor spaces, will remain in place for the next 30 days. Since the requirement for a national state of disaster to be declared in terms of the Disaster Management Act are no longer met, Cabinet has decided to terminate the national state of disaster with effect from midnight tonight. This means that travelers entering South Africa will need to show proof of vaccination or a negative PCR test not older than 72 hours. If a traveler does not submit a vaccine certificate or proof of a negative COVID-19 test, they will be required to do an antigen test on arrival. In China, nearly 40,000 doctors from different areas of the countries have been sent to Shanghai to help contain the current coronavirus outbreak. The National Health Commission reported that more than 11,000 doctors have taken out the of working at temporary hospital facilities and over 23,000 medical workers are responsible for collecting DNA samples. In the last 24 hours, the Shanghai region has reported 425 cases of local transmission of COVID-19. Meanwhile, authorities will continue to implement strict lockdowns until further notice. In Kenya, drivers queue for hours as the country reels from fuel shortages. Drivers wait at petrol stations in Kisumu in western Kenya amid another day of major fuel shortages with hours-long queues and strict re at rationing at petrol stations as pumps across the country ran dry. The government blamed for the snaking lines of browsers that worsened over the weekend. Oil dealers said they were owed outstanding subsidy payments from the state. The Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority said that the government was working to settle all arrears over to the dealers, but the government blamed hoarders for the shortfall and insisted it had sufficient reserves to supply the East African nation. According to a source, the crunch began last week in Kenya's West following a row between oil marketing companies and the government over subsidy payments. I carried the fuel tank of my bike because I could not push my bike to this place because of the distance. When I carry a jerry can, they don't sell to us, saying we are going to sell the fuel. So I have decided to remove the tank and walk with it. And if I don't get fuel, I won't return home because my children won't have anything for food. I then won't let me leave home without giving them food. The Confederation of African Football President Patrice Motsepa visited Ivory Coast, host of next year's Africa Cup of Nations, and commented on the country's upcoming election of its football federation ahead. The Confederation's president said he was reassured by the progress made by the Ivory Coast on a visit to the next Africa Cup of Nations host on Monday. This Cup of Nations will be from June to July of 2023. The West African country is building or renovating six stadiums for the competition. We are almost finished at the 60,000 capacity national stadium in Abimpe, as well as a 40,000 seat venue in the central city of Buake, and the 20,000 capacity ground in Yamosukuro. Motsepe said Ivorian football deserved unity and insisted there would be no losers in upcoming elections for president of the country's football federation. With that, we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at Telstra English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telstra English, I am Dio Martin. Thanks for watching.